Jigger, look out over the next two to five years, let's say 2030, and identify maybe two or three of the biggest uh, issues that we're going to see in the clean energy space and what role you might play in them. It's a great question. And, you know, look, I think that one of the big things that we can do this year, which I think will have a big impact on the next two to five years, is actually start to act like we're a dominant form of energy, right? And so what that means is that, you know, when you are 80% of everything that gets added to the grid, you have a responsibility to actually sponsor music festivals. You have a responsibility to get into the culture, right? You have a responsibility to really invest in media and communications. You have a responsibility to hire all of those influencers who have, you know, 400,000 uh, followers on, you know, TikTok or Instagram or whatever it is and pay them for each post to promote your products, right? You have a responsibility for doing all of these things that our industry has not done, right? Our industry in general does not participate in influence. Our industry largely says we're just better and we like make the air cleaner and we have all these incentives from the government. And so therefore all these things are occurring. Today, we are now like the lowest cost way of adding capacity and the fastest way of adding capacity. And in a time of AI load growth and EV charging and, you know, that load growth as well as air conditioning, right, which air conditioning continues to be the largest source of load growth in the entire world right now. Um, you know, it's important for us to actually invest in all of the traditional things that people invest in for influence, right? Have we have folks locally who are hired that do nothing but just educate um, local officials. Like when I talk to local officials, it's very clear that they don't understand the difference between transmission and distribution. They don't understand the difference between alternating current and direct current. They don't understand the difference between central utility scale solar and rooftop solar, right? And so these are the kinds of basic things that an industry that's grown up right, actually invests in. So I think over the next two to five years, you are going to see an explosion of investment into a lot of these levels of influence, because that is what you need to be able to continue to have the mandate to deploy 80% of everything that gets added to the grid. You're plugged into that conversation. Are you encouraged that the industry recognizes that that has to be done and intends to do it? Well, it's a very difficult thing for the industry, right? Because the industry understands, I think, very acutely that they have no political power, right? So whether that's in Canada or whether that's in the United States, I think in general, the industry recognizes that it has spent the bare minimum on political power building, which means that the most it can do is some tweak on the margins, like in the back room, without anyone noticing, right? They don't actually know how to do a full frontal assault conversation, which is what we're doing now in the United States, right? And so I think they realize that. But the big problem the industry has is that while we invest more capital every year than the oil and gas industry does, or the utility industry does for that matter, right, in the United States, then um, we don't have a capital structure by which to tax ourselves 1% of our investment every year into influence, right? And so as a result, people basically are fighting for, you know, project finance and figuring out how to do development and all these other things. And most of the money that comes into our industry is debt, right? And so that's not going to spend 1% of their, you know, money into influence. Debt is debt, right? You just go to the bank and you just get debt. So it's the equity that's going to invest the 1%, right? And our equity percentage is way lower, right? So when you think about the utility or the oil and gas industry, they might be 50% equity, maybe even more, and then 50% debt. Whereas our industry is 10% equity, you know, maybe maybe like, you know, maybe 15% equity, right? Because between the tax equity and the debt that we have, those are both sources of debt that are not going to pay for influence. So the only thing that's left is the sponsor equity in the middle, right? And so that amount of money is not going to invest the amount of money that they need to really make things work. And so we're going to have to figure out alternative ways of funding influence. You can imagine taxing our industry and saying, sorry, like 1% of everything 
that we do just has to go into this bucket and that bucket pays for media and comms and pays for local folks to, you know, build the grassroots, um, you know, pays for figuring out how to partner with labor and partner with consumers, right, to make sure that we're doing that. Um, and then also, you know, like figures out how to get people who are from our industry elected into office, right? Those are the four big buckets you have to do. I think the other piece that I would say our industry lacks is the ability to really solve big problems, right? So in general, a lot of our work has been, well, we're going to build as much solar and battery storage as possible, right? But when you have real acute challenges where like the governor says we are going to, into rolling blackouts and we need to solve this problem, right? Well, then what happens is, is you have to be more intentional. You have to say, well, instead of just installing solar randomly on people's rooftops, I need to in install solar and battery storage only on these four distribution circuits so we can actually make sure we solve the problem for the utilities so there aren't rolling blackouts on these circuits, right? And that is something our industry has not yet pivoted to, right? And so that is something we're going to have to do is to intentionally solve problems, not just like deploy more stuff in aggregate, but actually say, oh, there's a crisis over here. Let's deploy our technologies to solve that crisis. Well, Jigger, uh, now that you've left the Department of Energy, what role do you see for yourself in that process? I mean, I think I'm still trying to figure it out. I find that, you know, uh, you rarely have the ability to define your own role. I think the role gets defined within uh, a group that, you know, comes together and asks you to play a certain role, right? And so that stuff is still coming together. I certainly have continue to have a very large voice of influence on, you know, the podcast uh, that I have, Open Circuit. Um, I still have a pretty large influence on Twitter and, you know, and, and some of these other like sort of social media platforms like LinkedIn. Um, I continue to, you know, be able to amplify uh, solutions that I think are, you know, ready for prime time that can 100x, right, from where they are today. And, you know, I continue to be a valuable advisor to companies who I think are navigating tumultuous waters. And so I'm, you know, going to play that role. And, and I'm starting to get called by a lot of governments around the world who are saying, hey, Jigger, we passed all these policies, and nobody's using them. Uh, can you help us figure out how to use them? And so I've done some of that work. And so I continue to do that work. And, you know, like, I'm in a blessed financial position where I can you know, be helpful to people without having to worry about putting food on the table next week. Um, and so I'm going to continue to ask the industry where my best and highest use is and try to be as helpful as I can be um, as people answer that question. You mentioned earlier that, you know, the industry hasn't done a lot of comms and influence and, you know, political uh, constituency building. Do you see that there's an emerging generation of professionals within the industry, U.S., maybe outside of the U.S., who are going to do that work? Well, I certainly have met hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people who I think are ridiculously talented and have the ability to do that work. So I don't think we have a lack of talent that is being attracted to our industry to provide the services. I think we have a lack of recognition by the industry that they need to overspend on these things, not underspend, right? And so I think a lot of our folks are saying, well, what's the minimum I can spend to get away with, you know, getting permission to build this wind farm or getting permission to build a solar farm or, you know, getting the, you know, policies in place that, you know, help to accelerate what, I, what I'm doing. And my point is, why would you possibly take the largest wealth creation opportunity of our lifetimes and underspend, right? Why would you not overspend? What harm would come from, you know, oh, I spent $10 and I probably could have got away with $5, but you unlocked a $500 industry, right? And so like, what are we doing? Like, you know, like $5, $10, it doesn't matter. The unlock is $500, right? And so... I think that like, you know, I think people are starting to recognize that this is something they have to do. I was very fortunate to have recognized this back in 2004, 2005. And so when I ran Sun Edison, we always overspent on this. And the same thing was true when I was at Generate Capital. We always overspent on this. And we got the fruits of that, right? We end up getting, uh, you know, a 20, 30 X return on every dollar that we spent because we, you know, took more market share as a result. Um, but, you know, but I think that for a lot of people, um, they're very cost conscious. And, and so they have a hard time really understanding this. But I think that 
I think we're going to get there, right? I think over the next two to five years, I mean, when you have someone like President Trump who's kicking your ass on social media every single day, at some point you recognize, oh, maybe we're being targeted and maybe we actually have to come up with a sophisticated strategy um, to navigate these, these times. That leads me to my final question here, and that is the in my from my point of view, you're talking about building a political constituency within the jurisdiction, like within the United States, to support the industry, support policy, and so on. And I've made the argument in Canada that we don't have that and haven't done that kind of work to create a clean energy narrative, to create a clean energy political constituency. And it seems to me, that, that because you know China has the kind of government structure that it can say, okay, we're going to do this, and it just goes and does it. Yeah, and, and I don't want that structure to be clear. Yes, uh, you've made that you've made that very clear. But then, if you're going to live in a democracy and do things differently, then you do have to practice statesmanship. You do have to practice comms and all of that. And that maybe is the urgency here is as the industry grows, it needs all of the things you just talked about. It's not a nice to have, it's a need to have. Oh, for sure. I mean, any mature industry that's that's deploying hundreds of billions of dollars a year has to have this kind of, you know, sophisticated operation, right? I mean, that that is what you do, right? You You combat miscommunication, you invest in grassroots, you align yourselves with labor and consumers, and you elect people who are experts in your field into office, right? Dentists and doctors have folks who are elected. You know, real estate agents have folks who are elected. And the clean energy folks need to have folks who are elected into office, right? That's sort of how this works. And so, you know, I don't think the playbook is difficult to describe. I think getting people enthusiastic about it is something that, you know, requires somebody who's coming after you. We have that today in President Trump, who is galvanizing our industry and is suggesting to everybody that, hey, we need to invest in this. And I don't think it's like only supporting, you know, liberals or only supporting conservatives. I think, frankly, there are people who are supportive of this transition across um, all of those constituencies. And so this is about educating people. And the good thing is that the people People are with us, right? So if, if you ever have polling data that gets done, even with the president you know, coming after us, we still have a majority of Republicans who support clean energy, a majority of Democrats who support clean energy, et cetera, et cetera. So, like, so in general, the consumers are still there, right? Even with this onslaught. And so now the question is, how do you actually fund the, you know, the actual political work to make sure that you build real political power and that people have consequences if they cross our industry? That's how this works, right? Like, you know, Machiavellian, you know, thought hasn't changed in hundreds of years, right? This is not just inspiration, which is what we try to lean into because we're all hopeful people, but it's also fear. Like folks have to fear you. And so like if they cross you, there has to be consequences and that's how this works, right? And I feel like that is not something people generally want to do, but it is, you know, how you win. And so I think over the next two to five years, we're going to get there and we're going to succeed. Jigger, this is a fascinating series of conversations. Thank you very much for this. Of course. Thank you so much.